Over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing and highlighting some truly interesting people. Everyone who is anyone, both the famous and the infamous, from presidents and their first ladies to kings and queens, movie stars and pop stars, captains of industry, heads of state, sports personalities, innovative entrepreneurs, and some pretty fascinating everyday people. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Stephen Gracer, known by his students as the Cal Ripken of Harvard Business School. He is a highly regarded business and marketing educator, as well as a leader in sports business. In more than 50 years of teaching, he has never missed a class. Professor Gracer, nice to meet you, and it's a pleasure to chat with you today. Greetings from Boston to you and to your viewers. Absolutely. Sir, why don't we just start off by going over some of your educational bona fides. Can you take us through your career? Well, thank you. Uh, I've been very fortunate in having attended some very important institutions, uh, starting with the Boston Latin School, America's first school, founded in 1635. And our slogan is Summus Primi, we are first. Uh, I then was fortunate enough to go on to Harvard College and then to the Harvard Business School for an MBA and also for my doctorate. Um, and it was there that my students dubbed me the Cal Ripken of the Harvard Business School because at that particular time, I had never missed a class and I still haven't missed a class. How many years are we talking about, Professor? Over 50 years of teaching. Wow, that is amazing. That's called dedication, sir, but it's also called professionalism. I have to imagine as a professor, that's extremely important to you. It is, and to a great degree, it helps define my own brand. Talk to me a little bit about that brand. I know that we are going to be going into your educational qualifications, but brand building really and truly is your sweet spot. That is true. And it's really part of the work that I have done in my research. Uh, for example, with my two European colleagues, we created a concept called heritage brands. Heritage brands live in three time zones, the past, the present, and the future. An example is Patek Philippe, the watch company, whose slogan is, you never actually own a Patek Philippe. You simply take care of it for the next generation. And part of their pledge is they will repair any watch they ever made over the past several hundred years. Uh, another example of a heritage brand, by the way, would be the Nike swoosh. So um, we have studied that phenomenon and helped to articulate it. Um, another area that your viewers may find relevant is we are the only people to have done field-based research for attribution of branding of monarchies. And we have studied branding of monarchies with a royal family, where we spent an entire afternoon with the King of Sweden and his family discussing his brand and what we thought for our brands. How interesting is that? Because we talk about branding, however, you've created quite a niche for yourself. Um, in addition to your educational qualifications, your expertise is sought after in the area of sports. How did that interest come about? Well, like so many people, it came from my father, a blessed memory who took me to my first Red Sox game many at Fenway Park many decades ago. And he um, kept me involved with baseball and I became a season ticket holder with the Red Sox for 45 years plus so far. And he took me to my first Celtics game in the very first year of the predecessor league of the NBA. And I am, according to the Celtics, their longest tenured individual season ticket holder, which is over 60 years. That is quite an accomplishment. So it's one 
thing to love sports. It's another thing to be dedicated and to actually make it a part of your professional life. So why don't you take us through some of the highlights of your career, either as an educator or as a sports personality and professional? Well, I'll start briefly with an addendum to the sports side of it, which is I had broadcast, have broadcast three major sports on the air, uh, both play-by-play -play and color, and sometimes even commercials. Uh, seasonally, football, basketball, and baseball. Uh, and I have also uh, been fortunate enough to have produced a pregame radio show uh, for the Red Sox prior to their games on their own uh, station. So those are some things that have kept me at what you've characterized as being both interested in sports, but having it be part of my profession. And in terms of the, the other part of your career, it's one thing to be a sports personality. It's another thing to incorporate it in to your educational um, activities. Can you give me some examples of some of those highlights? Well, I am the only Harvard Business School faculty member who taught two MBA electives in the same year, one each semester, which I had, in fact, created myself. Uh, many people teach electives in both semesters, but the two that I did, one on corporate communications and one on sports business, I actually created them. That's extremely impressive, sir. Um, addition, in addition, you were a little humble when you were talking about your sports personality um, bona fides, because I understand you were actually involved in telecasting of the Beijing Olympic Games opening ceremonies. Tell me about that experience. I was somebody who got to watch it. You actually had to participate in it. Well, it was from their Washington office rather than in Beijing, but it was part of the opening ceremonies of the 2008 Olympics. Uh, that happened because I had been asked by CCTV in China if I would help them understand certain sports that they were going to have to televise, which were not part of the normal Chinese fan menu, so to speak. And I did that, and then they asked me to come to Washington to their North American office and to uh, participate in commentary on the opening ceremonies. I was with a gentleman who was an aesthetician, and he commented on the aesthetic aspects, and I was asked to comment on the branding implications for China. Uh, to get to your point uh, a little more, a few days later, I spoke with the woman who was my host and said, by the way, do you have any sense of how many people saw that segment of my, that I was on? Uh, footnote, they you, used clips from it uh, throughout that next day and the day after in the summary uh, programs about the Olympics. Uh, and she said she thought that it would have been about 80 to 100 million people. My word. Seen me. And I said, Nina, that is my the biggest classroom that I've ever had and no doubt ever will have. I cannot imagine how exciting that was. You know, uh, above and beyond the standard duties of an academic, clearly you are a Renaissance man, but you've served on a number of boards in board positions, especially in areas of public service. And I'm someone who believes very strongly in public service. Um, Tell me a little bit about those roles and what they've meant in terms of your professional and personal life. Well, uh, there are several that come particularly to mind. One is that I was the longest serving executive director of a research-based entity called the Marketing Science Institute. 
Uh, it's business supported, but it's the academic research is done by professors all over the world. Um, I was the first person to be elected to their quote hall of fame unquote by one of my successors. Uh, separately, I served two terms on the national advertising review board where we, uh, made reviews of commercials that were being shown by companies to determine whether they in fact fit with truth in advertising. So I did that for a number of years. It was a very proud, I was very proud to be able to do that uh, as a service to the profession. Uh, and then the other thing I would mention is that I also served on a number of corporate boards, uh, such as Tonka, the toy company, uh -huh. uh, and um, Doyle Dane Burnback, the advertising agency, and Opinion Research Corporation, which does research. So those are some things, the, the, the nonprofit ones where eventually I served on the board of public television and became elected by my colleagues to be the national vice chairman, one of the two, of PBS. Those are all things that are important to me, and they were meaningful to the dean that I served at the time at the Harvard Business School, who always approved my request to do things in the public sector. Yes, I can imagine that it brought prestige to an already prestigious institution. Um, the work that you have done clearly have made you a mentor over the years to a number of students who have been your mentors over the years. Well, I, was again, was very fortunate to have several. I had two intellectual mentors, and most professors of long standing have had intellectual mentors. My primary one was the legendary Raymond A. Bauer, who was a social psychologist uh, of considerable repute. And I was his first doctoral candidate and his first uh, research assistant when he came to the Harvard Business School from another institution. Also, the editor of the Harvard Business Review, Professor Edward Bursk, uh, was a marketing professor, and he also uh, mentored me in the area of marketing and marketing research. And separately, something that I doubt that any other professor at the Harvard Business School has ever had is I had a broadcast mentor. Um, my broadcast mentor for my work in broadcasting was Bob Wolf with two Fs, who is in two halls of fame for his work in baseball and basketball. Um, so I would say that my primary mentors were intellectual, but I also had a broadcast mentor of many, many, many years standing. You know, Professor, when I said you're a Renaissance man, I really did not know how true it was to say that. Sir, I see you have a number of books to your name. Um, and I know as an academician, that is extremely important. Tell me a little bit about some of the books that uh, you think the um, viewing audience would be interested in. Well, my bio notes that I have either written, edited, or been a co-author of 17 books, uh, which, you know, that's what professors do. They write books and articles. And in the case of HBS people, we write case studies, and I've had 300, over 300 published case studies by the Harvard Business School. And it's a long, complicated process for that, but I'll simply let your audience understand that the number 300 is very large relative to what most professors do. In terms of books, the very first book that I was involved with as co-author with Raymond A. Bauer was called Advertising in America, The Consumer View. And it was about how uh, the public, in a sample of the public, uh, reacts to ads themselves 
and to advertising as an institution. I would also note that uh, one of my more recent books done with my longtime British colleague is called Revealing the Corporation. And Revealing the Corporation is about things like identity, reputation, and other things of that nature. In addition to those, I have done a lot of articles that I won't particularly reference, but one that would be potentially amusing is that I hosted a 100th anniversary function at the Harvard Business School in class for the Red Sox when they had the 100th anniversary of Fenway Park. And one of the principal guests was their mascot, Wally, who actually came to class and stood right behind me. And we have a great photo of that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, you know, it all things come back to your love of sports and all things Boston. I get a theme here as we are chatting. Sir, looking back, what would you say have been your proudest contributions to education? And tell me how you've been recognized for those contributions, because I do see a part of your bio is a long list of accolades. My primary sense of contribution has been that my research has actually helped to improve the practice of marketing. Some professors concentrate on moving theory forward, and that's very good. But what I do is try to help recognize practice, and I hope that that is something that uh, other people grasp as well. And it is why I was elected last year in 2022 to the Market Research Council Hall of Fame in a competitive ballot and the plaque, and I'm looking at it right here, in recognition of contributions of outstanding and lasting value to the practice of market research. Namely, research that helps to improve practice is something that I'm hoping that people understand, such as the branding of monarchies and the branding of an identity of the Nobel Prize. But what I'm really proud of is that family as considers education to be a core value and uh, we have a lot of degrees in this household <laughs> including mine my wife who has uh, four degrees two in French and two in education our daughter who has won two awards uh, in the humanities for best teacher and has a, her own degrees and our son-in-law who headed the philosophy department at the University of Iowa for eight years. So I would say that dedication to education is a core value that I hope that people take away from what you and I have been talking about over the course of this interview. Professor, actually, um, I understand when I was doing a little research on you, that that core value was baked into you as a young child right there in your home from your own parents. That is true. And my father was a teacher and an artist. And I was about six years old when he first took me to the Museum of Fine Arts and I got enamored of the Egyptian collection. And I have been a follower of the, of, uh, exhibits at the Museum of Fine Arts ever since, and that's why I was happy to be the founding chair of the uh, Trustees Marketing Committee for the MFA uh, many years later. You know, Professor, I have to tell you what you have just proven by this conversation is that lifelong learning is absolutely imperative for families to start off very early. What your parents uh, poured into you as a young person, um, you are pouring back out to others and to members of the community through all of uh, your different Renaissance man type activities. And so I'd like to say thank you, Professor, for sharing a little bit today. Best wishes to you. You're going to be here a long time uh, imparting knowledge and giving these master classes on branding. Thank you, sir. 
You're welcome and you're very kind.